Good evening again. Uh, we are back to the study of the Spirit's book. Um, we are studying the law of preservation. We have the last item of the of the chapter to discuss, uh, which is called voluntary deprivations, mortifications. We talked about our need to preserve the physical body to better serve um, ourselves, the need to preserve nature, the need to preserve our environment, uh, to preserve our fellow um, human beings, animals, and uh, now we are going to go to the last item of uh, this, this chapter. So, uh, Philip, you read for us. Voluntary deprivations, mortifications. Does the law of self-preservation require us to provide for our bodily wants? Yes, labor is impossible without strength and help. So, very important here, the concept that the spirits gives to us, the importance of self-preservation, uh, taking good care of our physical body because we need our physical body to be in good shape for us to be able to help uh, and assist ourselves and others. If our physical body is struggling, we are going to uh, have struggle to function. And with that, instead of being able to help others, we may become a burden to society, a burden to others. So it is important it's uh, for us to take care of our body needs. But of course, we are going to go into more detail uh, with uh, this chapter, which is voluntary deprivations and other things. Okay, so 719. Are human beings at fault for seeking well being? Well-being is a natural desire. God only prohibits excess because excess is detrimental to survival. God has not made it a crime to seek well-being. If that well-being is not acquired at another's expense, and if it does not weaken your moral and physical strength. So it's important here that the, sp the spirits do not talk about the limits of uh, our need for taking care of our necessities, right? Because for each person, each individual, its spirit is different. Uh, then this in instinct of self-preservation that we as eternal spirits have when we are incarnated is the natural instinct of self-preservation of the physical body. Uh, now, with the self-preservation of the physical body, we may fall into the excesses, right? And we see that, you know, we talked a little bit last week, right? People that uh, take excessive care of their physical body to the extreme um, in, um, in trying to build more muscles than we need in trying to look uh, better than uh, we should at our uh, age or to, you know, plastic surgery that nowadays is very uh, common and very used for vanity issues. Well, what are the limits, right? So um, when you talk about plastic surgery to correct uh, imperfections of the physical body that will help us live a better life, that's what plastic surgery uh, exists for. When we talk about plastic surgery, for someone that works with their physical body, it is understandable and even, uh, you know, acceptable in the sense that some, you know, if you work as a model, for instance, and it, you, you, it's important for you to have certain features of your physical body to better uh, serve your profession. Um, you know, 
again, it's not an excess. The problem is that normally you start and then you start uh, doing another one and a third one and a fourth one and you want to have a perfect body and then that's when it becomes excess, right? Um, the same thing with food, the same thing with exercise. They're all part of our, the necessities of our physical body, but we abuse. Um, well-being in the sense of not the physical body, well-being in terms of our living conditions, our house, our uh, what we need, uh, our gadgets that we need to to live uh, a better life. What is where is the excess and where is the the needed? Again, it's different from me to you to others because uh, some of these gadgets may be relevant to my profession that I need them and may not be needed for someone else's profession and vice versa. So when it's, it becomes an excess, it's different for each person. So the important thing here, again, we are not perfect spirits. We are not, uh, we don't know the exact uh, limitations of our needs, but we have to have as much possible of common sense to deal with our necessities and to, to, to make sure that we have a comfortable life in order to uh, be able to work on improve ourselves morally and intellectually, which is doing work in charity, helping others, right? So the part that the spirits talk here, well, the well-being is not acquired at another's expense and does not weaken your moral and physical strength. This is important also, right? How are we acquiring this well-being? If we are causing harm to others or causing others to, to struggle, then it's we are uh, going against the natural law. And uh, when they say not weaken your moral physical strength, goes back, for instance, in the plastic surgery, right? If we are doing it only for vanity, if we're doing because we need to uh, to build a, a more beautiful physical body for, for others to see, we are weakening our moral uh, strength, right? So that's what the spirits are talking here. Okay, any questions, comments? Okay. 720. Are voluntary deprivations meant to serve as a voluntary atonement laudable in God's eyes? Do good to others and you will acquire more merit. Is any voluntary deprivation laudable? Yes. The self-deprivation of useless indulgences because it weakens the hold that matter has on human beings and elevates their soul. Resistance to the temptation that solicits excess or indulgence in what is useless is praiseworthy. Equally, commendable is cutting back on your necessities so that you have more to give to those in need. If your deprivations are only a vain pretense, they are a derision. So oh, it's important here. Uh... The concept, the basic concept is charity, right? And charity in, in more ample sense, in helping others. So if you are uh, voluntarily depriving yourself or something in order to help someone else, it is uh, what it will help us evolve morally, right? Do good to others and you acquire more merit. So we intimately know what we are doing, right? When we deprive ourselves for, of something, are we doing because we think that in the eyes of God, we are going to acquire merit? Are we doing because we think that with that, we are making a sincere effort to improve ourselves because we know our imperfections and we know our temptations and to control our temptations and to allow to resist our temptations is also to work on our self-improvement. Uh, and if we are 
depriving ourselves of something in order for others to have more uh, resources. We are practicing charity. Then, of course, it's, uh, it's laudable, as they say here, the voluntary deprivation. If it's only for, for a vain pretense, and uh, again, we have just have to look at our conscience to know if uh, what we are doing is sincere or it's just we are pretending to, to deprive ourselves of something to look good in the eyes of others, right? Do not uh, allow your right hand to see what your left hand is doing, right? Jesus told us. Because if, uh, if I'm uh, doing charity in terms of showing off, it's better than not doing charity, but you are not really acquiring a lot of merit in that because you are doing just as an exhibitionist, more than sincere desire to help others. You, are, you just want to, good, to look good uh, to others uh, instead of... Uh, of working on on evolving and progress okay questions comments Seven twenty one. throughout the course of time and among all populations there have been those who have lived a life of ascetic mortification is any ascetic life ever praiseworthy ask yourselves to whom such a life is useful and you will have the answer to your question if such a life only serves the person who leads it and it prevents the person from doing good it is a form of selfishness regardless of the pretext it hides behind true mortification according to christian charity is to impose self-deprivation and work upon yourself for the benefit of others. Yes, continuing on the subject, right? Um, if you are depriving yourself from uh, the physical uh, benefits of the physical life in order to, to elevate yourself, but you are not doing any good to anyone else, you are really not making any progress. You are just being selfish because we are here to live in society. We are here to evolve, and the only way to evolve is to practice charity. And we, when you live in isolation, you are not doing any charity. It's impossible to do charity when you are living alone. Uh, again, with exceptions, always we, we, we have to remember there are uh, monks that uh, through their isolation and their mental vibration, they help elevate the, the vibration of the planet. But this is the rare exception and really rare exception, but it exists. Also, you know, a practical, if you live in an island that have a, a how do you say the light, uh, the, the light that illuminates the, yeah, the uh, God. Yeah, I know. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, Jeez. The lighthouse? The lighthouse. Thank you. Such a simple word. Thank you. Let's say you, you go to live in an island that you are taking care of a, a lighthouse and you live in complete isolation, right? But you are not being selfish because you are working and you are helping others. So not all forms of isolation is uh, isolation in terms of not doing anything good. Also, Let's uh, think of our, our lives nowadays with the possibility of being connected uh, through, you know, through internet with the world. <laughs> um, there are, you can go to a place and be isolated and still be of service. You know, if you are a psychologist and you give consultations online, if you are, if you work on a, things for the benefit of others. So again, let's take this understanding of what the spirits are saying here in terms of those that, uh, especially in religious uh, organizations that isolate themselves from the world, not to be contaminated by the world and to uh, avoid being fall into temptations. 
you are you don't really fall into temptation uh, uh, overcome your temptations if you are avoiding them altogether right you know you are only going to know if you if you really overcome your uh, your addictions if you are faced with the opportunity of uh, of testing yourself again we're, we're not saying for anyone that is addicted to go and uh, go next to the addicted you need to have the strength and the certainty that you are able to resist to expose yourself but only when you expose yourself and maybe this is for not even for this incarnation is for next one you'll be able to understand if you have overcome the the the, the temptations and the, the addiction so you know charity without charity there is no salvation applies all the time and applies to all these questions here that we are seeing okay 722 is there any virtue in abstaining from eating certain foods as practiced among various religious or ethnic groups? Whatever you can eat without harming your health is permitted. Legislators may have prohibited certain foods for a useful purpose and portrayed them as emanating from God to give these regulations greater authority. Yes. So the spirits are very simple and direct. Whatever you can eat without harming your health is permitted, right? We need to take care of physical body and whatever is available for us that can help our physical body uh, sustain itself and take care of it are, uh, is what we need. Again, we can go into a much longer discussion here uh, in terms of nowadays we are more and more understanding about what our physical body needs, as understanding that certain foods are not uh, healthy, understanding that uh, some we should avoid one thing or the other. But the, the answer in 1857 was more directed at the religions that forbid people to eat certain foods. And, uh, the, the, and the example we have is the you know, the Jewish uh, religion that uh, for the, the more orthodox Jewish religion that asks you to separate uh, cheese from meat and not, you, you cannot eat pork. And uh, all of these are is said to be <coughs> God's law. And uh, <clears throat> I, I mentioned this in the past, right? There are 608 uh, commandments from Moses and only 10 are commandments that come from God. All the rest were creations of uh, Moses and the lawmakers in order to discipline the people. Because why did they forbid to eat uh, pork? Because it's a, a, a meat that is very easy to contaminate if, if not taken proper care. So at that time, they were crossing the desert, 40 years crossing the desert, exposed to all these uh, dangers so it was it's easy it was easier to say that is a prohibition that comes from god and all the other prohibitions that other religions have from for food also it's easier to say that they come from god like the muslims have with alcohol uh, and again what the spirits are telling us here is that uh, as long as it's healthy everything is permitted okay um, and we are going to go into the consume of, of animal flesh in the next question. So if you have any questions related to that, wait for the next question. If not, if you have any questions not related to that, <laughs> you can ask. Okay. 723. Does the consumption of animal flesh by human beings contradict natural law? With your physical makeup, flesh nourishes flesh. And without this kind of sustenance, human strength declines. The law of self-preservation requires humans to keep up their strength and health to fulfill the law of labor. They should, therefore, eat according to the requirements of their bodies. 
Okay, so before we go to this question, I want to go back to something that we discussed last week that uh, we didn't, I didn't have the original um, translation here. Question 709, uh, we talked about uh, the, 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 the question from Kardec was not correctly translated. So it says, when during extreme crisis, where human beings are forced to kill and consume the flesh of other human beings to survive, are they committing a crime? So it was missing the kill here. So you are killing other human beings for the sole purpose of uh, consuming their flesh because in order to survive. And the answer from the spirits is say that this is, in these cases, uh, it's both homicide and a crime, a crime against nature. Okay, I just want to come back and correct this because, because this is recorded. So I want to, to everybody to have the, the correct uh, question that uh, we discussed the answer. And uh, we, we discussed the answer based on what we suppose this was the question, the original question, right? Elm, I don't know if you have anything to add. I think just something for us to observe every time. The spirit is an extremely objective that we answer the question as it's placed to us. And every time there's a doubt that they are not really, really asking the answering that question, we should, there should be a flag for the say, let me go back to the original and see this again. Because we expect their spirits again to be extremely frugal with words, extremely rejective. They will ask exactly what you asked. And the unfortunately in this translation, there is a there is a question and there is an answer that does not answer the question. Yeah. So, but um, I, you know, uh, we actually answer in the way that it was supposed to, to be questioned because we discussed uh, the, um, uh, the answer in terms of being a crime, right? Um, so talking about a consumption of animal flesh, right? Again, uh, nowadays, uh, and uh, Elmo can talk about it better than I can, we have, we can survive if we if we know what we are eating. We can survive without uh, eating animal flesh. There are sub substitutes. We, science has progressed enough to teach us uh, what can we eat uh, to to not consume animal flesh. But uh, our physical body still needs a lot of the nutrients that are easier to find in animal flesh. And, uh, you know, you cannot um, feed 8 billion people without animal flesh at this level of our evolution. So it is necessary. Uh, we discuss this if we stop the cons consumption of, of animals, uh, the world collapses because the superpopulation of animals uh, that are, are created for a, human consumption would be a, a, a huge problem. So the transition, like everything in life, the progress has to be slow, uh, has to go pace uh, in, you know, in, in step by step. So we are learning more and more, how can we replace animal uh, flesh? And eventually we won't, our physical body, we will also, uh, evolve in a way that it won't need it. But the way we are physical bodies today, we need the nutrients. And we need to know how to replace them if we're not consuming them, okay? Because if we don't consume them and we don't replace correctly, we are going to cause harm to our physical body, which again goes against the natural law, which is to survive, okay? Yeah, we, I don't think there's a need to go too much on this right now, but there was some time in our anthropological development that our brain was growing so fast that we needed more than just what vegetables could 
supply. And you develop the necessity of, of eating flesh to supply the demand of protein for the very fast growing brain. There are much and so much. So they have blood vessels that are called new blood vessels in the brain They're because they have an, an extra need of blood supply for that brain. Things of other animals does not, brains does not have, humans have because that's special need. So there was a need of having extra nutrient, extra protein. And there are some amino acids that are so-called endometrial amino acids that flesh provides the whole package together, all of them. If we eat a steak, if we eat a fish, if we eat a chicken, you get all those amino acids combined in one package. Can we do that without, without flesh? Yes. Indians will know how to do that for about 7,000 years already. Right, but there is a know-how to make the combination of different special legumes that you combine them together and they will provide with all those essential amino acids. Now you have to know, you have to know how to how to make the combination and you have to have access to them. If you don't, you gotta be more nourished. Okay. And when I say essential, they are extremely essential. You will not, you'll be extremely deficient in one of those amino acids and you'll be syndromes or diseases if you may, because of that deficiency. So we can, today we know that, we know how to combine some legumes, some vegetables and get all the essential amino acids in one package. But for most of us, we don't have the know-how, we don't have a Accept to it, and again, we provide everything. The problem again, the discussion here is like, right? You go to China and we ask for a chicken broccoli, and and we Americans gonna ask where is the chicken? Chinese come over here, they ask for chicken broccoli, and ask where is the broccoli? They think it's loads of excess of protein that cause more harm than good. So nothing is bad, everything is good. Now I have to know the proper amount to when and not become an excess. Okay, anyone else? Seven. Okay. 724, is there any merit in abstaining from any particular kind of food when suffering? when suffered as a form of penance? Yes, if suffered for the sake of others. However, God cannot regard any mortification as laudable if it is not a serious and useful deprivation. This is why we say that those who practice superficial deprivation are hypocrites. Yeah, the, the answer from the spirit is very direct, right? If suffered for the sake of others, right? For abstaining for any particular kind of food, uh, because others are hungry and we are giving our food to others, then it's what it's that. That's when we have merit. Otherwise, there is no uh, merit in abstaining from any particular food that uh, is helpful to us. Uh, and again, uh, when we think of a uh, you know, for you go to, to India, for instance, where cows are sacred, right? This is just for religious purpose, right? Because there is no merit in abstaining from eating uh, meat from cows if you are eating meat from others. It's the same thing with, uh, with porks from Jewish and uh, it's a religious belief and again, a it's a dogma if they are comfortable with it that's fine also because we respect the religious beliefs but uh you know according to the spirits here there is no need for any of this because again we one concept that we have to have in mind when we are studying this uh, law of preservation is we the spirit and the 
spiritual principle, which is before we, individual spirit, is eternal. So when you are killing an animal to eat, you're not killing the spirit. You're not killing the intelligent principle. You are killing the physical body of the animal. The progress of the spiritual principle will continue. The same way when we, our physical body dies, we continue, continue to live, it's just our physical body. It's important to remember this when we talk, especially when we go into the next uh, uh, chapter, and then, you know, it's a preview of the next chapter, which is law of destruction, right? When we are going to talk about all the different destructions that happen on earth, that what we are destroying here is never the spirit or the spiritual principle. We are eternal. So we can destroy even the planet like we are unfortunately doing, right? In many ways. Uh, so if we end up destroying the planet, we continue with a heavier karma than we have, right? All, all 32 billion of us here on this planet, but we continue. There's, we cannot destroy spirits. We cannot destroy spiritual principle. So it's important to keep that in mind when we are talking, because sometimes we tend to give too much importance to material things, physical, of the physical world, and we forget that uh, all of these uh, are renewable, are here to be transformed and to be uh, improved. Everything on earth, including animals and ourselves. Our physical body is also improving. So when we leave our physical body behind, when we come back in the 100 or 200 years or whenever we come back in a new incarnation, we hope to get a better physical body, an improved physical body, right? 100, 200 years is not much for it to change that much, but uh, you know, the appendix is changing now for, you know, for in a shorter period of time, right? Yeah. So it's possible. Danielle. So since the point here is self-preservation, I there is this, this discussion now that depending on how we produce food, like uh, uh, industrialized ag agriculture and meat production is destroying, is contributing to change the climate and to be short, damage the uh, earth, right? So yes. in destructive way. So, but at the same time, these mass productions are here to feed the amount of population that we have on earth. So it's sort of like very tricky because if, if we keep coming in big numbers because we need this experience here, right? So to keep going, but at the same time, it's costing our self-preservation in the way that we are destroying our own habitat. It, that's something that I, I, it's a puzzle I cannot put together. <laughs> yeah, um, we need to find balance, right? Uh, in the end, it's balance because uh, it's important for us as humanity to progress. And the, the way we progress is through reincarnations and uh, preservation of the life of the human beings. It's, it's very important. I'm not going to say this more important because without the planet, we have to all go to another one. But uh, the importance of the preservation of the planet has to be balanced with the preservation of life in the planet for us humans. Uh, this is all very new, Daniela. That's important for us to remember. Nobody was talking about this 100 years ago, right? So we made already a huge um, 
improvement in understanding the damage that we are causing to the planet and the understanding the damage is the first step to be able to find solutions for the damage that we are causing so if the law is of, of progress we have to believe that we will continue finding ways to improve um, the preservation of the planet without causing harm to preservation of the humans living in the planet but we don't have that solution right now but we are working on it right uh, i don't know if you read this this um, it was announced a couple of days ago that for the first time we were able to produce um, energy, energy uh, the solar energy, right? And the energy that happens in the sun with, uh, with less, because we used to have to, to use more energy to produce a smaller amount of energy. And for the first time, we were able to produce a larger amount of energy with lesser energy that went into it. Of course, with decades away of uh, producing anything, um, that can be useful, but it's a first step. So we are developing all the time. Uh, and again, it's 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 to find the balance, it's it's a challenge. We are in perfect spirits and we are more still more selfish than not selfish in the sense that we are uh, trying to 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 preserve ourselves above all, right? So that harms also the the effort of uh, of humanity, but um, again, the answer, like many other things, is balance, right? Is to find balance. Yeah, as as you have said already, the the problem of production is the distribution. If you produce exactly what we are producing now, we have enough, plenty for everyone. We don't need to produce more. If we just know how to distribute it properly. Now we have the know-how or how to gain all the necessary nutrients without farming, without not killing animals. It's very low. It's a new step for us to take. Now we have hydro farms. You know, you can you can have a farm not that does not grow horizontally, but can grow now vertically. You can have hydro farms in a building right now instead of growing this way. We have developed the techniques that will allow us to be productive without uh, disturbing as much the ecosystem. But again, just George Ross said, and I have a hundred years, I think is very, being very, very good to us. It's maybe 50 years that we're really talking about all this. So there is ways that we are able to remain productive, to feed everyone, and to still protect most of the eco ecosystems. It's a, it's a matter of redirecting our energy from greed to more charity. You know, talking about time, I read something this week that I find fascinating. Uh, Cleopatra is closer to us than the construction of the pyramids. Yes, what that means. What that means. <laughs> it means that uh, she lived, uh, the time that she lives, from the time she lives to today, is smaller than the time that she lived from the construction of the pyramids. Yes, think about that. The construction of the pyramids was, um, Four thousand years be before Christ, she lived around the time of Christ, a little bit before, right? The time of, and uh, we are two thousand years later. So, so it's yeah, we we think about Cleopatra and we think about Egypt. That we put all in the same basket, right? <laughs> so you see how how amazing time is and how we don't really understand the. Concept. The concept, right? Actually, the phrase was Cleopatra is closer to the iPhone than she is from the pyramids. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's a good one. I like that. <laughs> so, you know, mm -hmm. what is 50 years in terms of what we have learned about the damage we, we have done to Earth? Nothing. Uh, 100 years from now, we, we will have learned much more of, about the destruction 
but also learn much more about how to uh, control or prevent, right? Um, yeah, the destruction of the ozone layer is something that uh, we had no idea in the 60s. And nowadays we are already actively trying to reduce uh, the ways that it is being destroyed, right? And that's why, you know, and you have the electric cars and you have all those, all those sort of things coming that we can only imagine how it's going to be in the future. Okay. Um, also, we are talking about food, but uh, also for construction, we don't need these days to destroy as much as forest with all the, the techniques that are still developing, but they already exist from using um, plastic bottles to make it bricks or to use other type of recycled materials to use in a construction, um, either for housing or furniture. So yeah. not only food, we are developing. Developing, yes, yeah. in all, all areas of evolution. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. you're right, absolutely right. Yes, and when you have the discussion, the discussion, I think is very important, but I think it's also important because it's very useful to think, what are the government doing? What is the United States doing? What are, but think at, as an individual, what can I do? What, what this discussion here, how can I take it at a personal level? In, in terms of reuse, recycle, do I need to go to McDonald's and have a, a Big Mac that has three patties or one patty is enough? Why do I need the three patties of, of beef in that, in that thing? Why not one? What am I doing by doing this? I'm minimizing the excess sphere. How can I reuse and recycle things in my own home? Take those things at the personal level and we'll make a difference if each one of us does. And if no one else does, at least you'll be able to clean conscience. Exactly. Yeah, and as we become aware, we are responsible. The more you know, the more responsible you are. But it's on an individual level, right? If you cannot uh, solve the problems of the world, right? Uh, the passage that uh, we read this Monday from uh, Living Spring, right? Talked about that, of, of, of walking small steps, of doing small things, uh, taking care of your day-to-day -day business if you want to reach the bigger things, right? Um, it, is, it is doing our, as I almost said, doing your your part uh we are going to contribute and again uh it's we live in a society we cannot be responsible for what other the other eight billion are doing but we can we are 100 percent responsible on what we are doing right okay 724 or five five is there any merit in abstaining? No, oh, 725. What should we think of the mutilation of bodies of humans and animals? What is the purpose of such a question? Ask yourself whether something is useful or not. What is useful dis useless displeases God, and what is harmful disappoints the purpose of creation. Rest assured that God only appreciates sentiments that elevate the soul. It is by practicing divine law and not by violating it that you can shake off your material envelope. Yeah, um, self-flagellation, um, other types of mutilation of the, of the body for religious purposes, for uh, vanity purposes. What is the purpose uh, of this? Is useful or not? And again, useful for us and for society as a whole. That's the answer that from the spirits. I was thinking here, trying to go a little deeper, what, what, uh, what is the reason for the question? Um, you know, I could think about the circumcision in the amongst the Jews, but um, I couldn't go, go. You know, there is mutilation also in some African tribes, right, of uh, of women. 
And, uh, um, you know, in terms of the circumcision, again, is another thing that was done because it's um, or, or originally because it's um, healthy wise is uh, uh, prevents infections at that time. And then it became uh, a dogma, a tradition, right? Uh, nowadays, it still happens when it's needed or the Jewish continue, continue to do it. But uh, the mutilations that happen in African tribes are just, just aggressions to the body of the, the women. And we see some people that uh, through um, changes in their physical body, through plastic surgeries, through, you know, even through tattoos, um, you know, for vanity reasons are causing harm to themselves or risking themselves. So everything that is not useful according to our evolutionary path is something that, um, you know, it's not in line with the divine law. I don't know if you can think of more, more than that, Elmo, that uh, what, and I don't know, a mutilation of animals, I don't know if uh, we used to do at that time, or I don't know what, what mutilation of animals Kardec talks about here. Yeah, I, I, I don't know if you guess grasping for the sacrifices. Oh. But it's the only thing that I could think of. Yeah. No, but again, I don't know if Kadak specifically asking about sacrifices here. And then you'll ask, okay, so you, you kill a dog, how would that possibly please God and anyone else? Yeah. You know, you kill a lamb. Why why is God happy because you offer God a bad lamb? Right? Okay. 726. Yeah. If the suffering of this world elevates us, depending on how we bear it, are we elevated by that which we voluntarily create for ourselves? You can only be elevated by natural suffering because they come from God. Voluntary suffering is worthless when it is not useful to others. Do you think that those who shorten their lives by superhuman hardships as practiced by the bonzes, fakirs, fanatics, and various religious groups advance their progress by doing so? They should spend their time focused on doing good for their fellow human beings. They should clothe the naked, comfort those who cry, work for the disabled and deprive themselves for the sake of the unfortunate, and then their lives will be useful and pleasing to God. When you experience voluntary suffering for yourself alone, it is selfishness. When you suffer for others, it is charity. These are the commandments of Christ. Yes, uh, so the concept that you evolve through suffering so you are going to find voluntary suffering so you suffer more you evolve more it's a myth of course the spirits are very clear here when you suffer for yourself voluntary suffering for yourself alone is selfishness when you suffer for others is charity uh, without charity there is no salvation the answer is is that that simple and uh, then uh, the spirits talk a little bit about others you know, the fakirs are those that uh, lay on, um, on beds of um, nails. Um, fanatics of various religions that, um, you know, create voluntary um, suffering for themselves through their actions. Um, you know, are, they're not really progressing. They are only uh, doing it out of fanaticism or out of... Uh, exhibitionism sometimes right uh the only true suffering that elevates us is the ones that uh, happen to us because of our natural uh progress in life our natural lives or because we are <coughs> sacrificing ourselves for the benefit of others these are the sufferings that elevates us all the rest 
it's uh, we are just causing it's being selfish, just causing harm to ourselves. Okay. I I have a question. Yes. One question. Yeah. What are how do you pronounce that? Bonzi. Bonzi. What bonzi is? I missed that. I have no idea what it means. Oh, okay. And then uh, suffering for suffering for others. Could you expand on that? Because I find that a little bit kind of codependent as we see it, you know, nowadays. No. So I, can you explain a little bit more? Yeah. What a hospital for others is, is a virtue because you could be suffering for others as a codependency issue. And that's, I don't think it's enhancing at all. No, no. What, what they're saying here, when you are suffering because you are, you are depriving yourself for something for the benefit of others. Right, oh, depriving okay. yourself of food, of uh, of uh, shelter, uh, all the 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 voluntary uh, deprivations that you do for yourself in benefit to the benefit of others. Not when you are suffering together with someone else, just be, to to <laughs> to be your you yeah, know, I'm think, I'm thinking misery you know, love I'm, company. Not in the exactly, context of misery exactly. love company. No, yeah, it's suffer here in the sense of. Uh, doing for others, depriving yourself of, from things into the benefit of others. Okay, okay. Th thank you, thank you. That's uh... okay. Okay, last one. Seven twenty-seven. Since we should not create voluntary suffering for ourselves that serves no purpose for others, should we protect ourselves from that which we can anticipate or that which threatens us. The instinct of self-preservation has been given to all beings to serve as a safeguard against danger and suffering. Chastise your spirit and not your body. Mortify your pride and stifle the selfishness that like a snake devours your heart. By doing this, you will do more for your development than any amount of mortifications which are no longer appropriate for the time period in which you are living. Okay, so the, the question here is that uh, if we, if we are not supposed to create voluntary suffering uh, that serves no purpose, should we try to defend ourselves from uh, possible uh, sufferings that will come our way, that we think will come our way? And, uh, the spirits are talking about the instinct of self-preservation that give us all the rights to try to prevent uh, dangers and suffering. Yes, we should make the effort, uh, the utmost effort to prevent suffering because if we are suffering, we are struggling and we may not be able to be of service to others if we are struggling too much. So yes, we should do everything that is possible to avoid suffering. Now, what they, the spirits say here, which is very important, is chastise your spirit and not your body. Mortify your pride and stifle the selfishness that like a snake devours your heart. So work on the spirit. Uh, deprive you, eternal spirits, of the excesses and the temptations that we still have in our imperfections. And that's what the we should do in terms of progressing. Um, the I, actually what what the the spirit says here in the last phrase, which are no longer appropriate for the time period in which you are living in the original, it says which are no longer appropriate for the century you are living. That was what the spirit said in the nineteenth century. Then the translator said, "Well, we are in another two centuries later." So let's talk about in the time that you are living, which is, I think is appropriate, right? Yes. We, we should not be creating uh, sufferings that are not needed for us, uh, for our physical body. We need, we need to create uh, actually um, ways of making our life easier and better in order to dedicate ourselves to the service of others, right? And that's what we as human beings in general have been doing for, uh, 
always you know trying to to learn and to progress and to achieve more comforts that will make our life easier uh in order to to progress i you know i was uh talking to someone today that uh he, he was traveling upstate new york and he was saying i i don't understand how this uh, immigrants that came here in the colonization decided to to go up to New York in this cold weather and this miserable weather that we have here. Why don't go south? Okay. And I told him, listen, at that time, if you go south, you had snakes and uh, mosquitoes and a lot of heat. So yeah. <laughs> pick your poison, right? Nowadays, you you know you can think about that, but uh, at that time, you know you choose which which you makes you suffer less. And again, they were looking at that time of ways to find comfort and to protect themselves from the from nature. And uh, we are still doing the same. We are still trying to progress, to defend ourselves, and to help humanity progress, because the ultimate objective is for us as humans to progress and to evolve, to live in a better place, like in the world that will become a world of regeneration and then a happy world one day, right? So that's our objective, okay? Any questions? We're going to stop here because we will leave law of destruction for next week. Good study for right before Christmas, right? <laughs> Law of destruction. <laughs> but anyway, it's, we'll, we'll, we'll study it with a positive uh, view on it. Okay. Um, we have our, our last Saturday lecture by the United States Spiritist Federation of the Year this Saturday. Uh, I know it's Marcio Lazaro from uh, the Danbury, uh, uh, Alan Kardec uh, Spirit Society of Danbury that is going to give the lecture. I don't remember the subject and I never received the, the flyer. So join for Saturday. Marcio is a very good speaker and uh, very knowledgeable. So I'm sure you enjoy. And also we have our last Sunday study this Sunday where we're going to start study the Medium's book. And then we'll stop for two Sundays um because of uh, christmas and new years uh the book club stopped last wednesday and we'll come back on uh january 11th with hail christ uh sgny will be closed from the 23rd to the second we'll reopen on tuesday january 3rd with uh, spiritist menun uh but we'll be here next thursday still Next Thursday is the 22nd. So it will be our last meeting before the, the, the end of the year. So we are here Sunday studying the Medium's book. Monday with our spiritual assistant, Pepsis. Uh, Tuesday with the study of uh, the book Empty Lives that Jusara is doing at noon. And Thursday uh, with the Law of Destruction, Chapter 6. Okay? Um, Soraida, can you do our final prayer? Yes, of course. And now, dear Father, as we come to the end of our beautiful meeting here today, with hearts full of gratitude, we thank you as we gather here again in the learning of what is needed in our lives. We thank the spiritual benefactors, our guardian angels, allowing us to practice all this and to understand the help that is practiced and teaching that they have given us to put into practice, to help each and every one of us to understand the necessity of charity and merit in our lives. May we continue in doing all that we can in helping our brothers and sisters that are in need in both worlds, the spirit world and the physical world. We ask for their assistance and guidance, dear Lord. And as we begin the blessings of our Christmases now, may we continue with our prayers at home to be kind to each other, to our families and loved ones and those that don't care much for us. 
and pray for all those that are suffering outside of our homes. For we are grateful for all that we have received here and continue to receive. May we ch cherish every moment of it and put into practice. We pray, dear Father, for our Spirit Descent of New York, for all Spirit Descenters, all that are working toward the light of our Christ. May we understand the importance of all that we have been given. And we ask as we leave here today to continue to pray in our daily homes with our families and loved ones. And again, return next week to continue our studies. We are grateful, dear Father. And with this in mind, we ask permission to close our meeting today. So be it.